podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And welcome to another episode of Media Matters for Anfield Index. The Reds are still top of the league. They're still making us nervous, but they're still getting the job done. And God, how we love them. And I'm excited as ever to talk to the usual man, the renowned and the respected David Lynch. David, how are we? Yeah, good. Just about dried out after last night as well. So, um, yeah, my laptop's still working, even though it was absolutely soaking. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, it was one of those nights last night, wasn't it? Even just walking across Stanley Park to get into the ground, absolutely sodden. But the Reds warmed us all up. So we'll do the usual, ladies and gents. We'll talk through the Newcastle game. We'll have a look at the player in focus. There's some distinct talking points. And as I promise, I always try and get us away from referees, but they just keep bringing us back at times, don't they? We'll talk about the coming weeks and we'll go to the questions from you guys as well that you want me to pose to David. So... I mean, God, this is a hell of a game. It really was, David. 4-2. I mean, record XG. I'm sure everyone's seen that stat. I'll quote that stat a thousand times. Salah gets two. Misses a penalty. Gakpo and Jones get on the, the score sheet. I mean, there's so much going on in this game. It's unreal. How, when you're looking back, and obviously you've dried out now and in the cold light of day, how do you assess that performance overall? I think I think it sort of still tallies with with what I felt at, at full time really that you know we we'd spoken a while about or a long time about the idea that, that Liverpool needed a statement performance to really announce themselves yeah. in the title race and I, I feel like this was it uh, you know it it was nip and tuck it for for parts I think I wrote in a piece I wrote this morning actually that Liverpool were only two goals ahead for 14 minutes out of the 97 wow. minute play which shows that it was actually like tight through quite a lot of the game but the reality is performance wise, they were just carving Newcastle open time and time again and and, and fully deserved to win by, you know, a, a bigger margin. I mean the, the XG they clock up, it's you know, sometimes you end up with a with a high XG in, in certain games and and, and and sometimes that will be from taking a, a, an awful lot of pot shots. They do eventually add mm-hmm. up to a decent sum in your XG, but the fact that Liverpool Gets such a high amount is on the basis that it was quality chance after quality chance. They were setting up tap ins constantly, which one of the things I absolutely loved about the performance actually getting people in front of the goalkeeper for tap ins. Yeah. That's something Liverpool have lacked recently. So love that. And, and and just in the end, you know, it, it shows you how difficult football is. Is that you're up against a side like Newcastle that they made it tight for so much of the game. You know, despite the fact they were getting battered, really, they still had the quality to sort of stay within touch. And also, you need a bit of luck in there as well. And then, yeah, so to see Liverpool sort of hammer it home at the end and, and get a four-two win, which they fully, fully deserved. And, and as I say, I think it was, I think it was that statement performance. It's the the slickest they've looked and the best that certain players have performed in a while as well. Just too too many positives almost to analyse, and uh, yeah. the mood should be so up in the camp now, and real belief that this is the this is the start of the new year now, and Liverpool are going to really bounce into this, and hopefully they can they can go on one of those big runs that we we're used to under Jurgen Klopp, yeah. and, and and go on and win the title. Yeah, there are so many positives. I think the only that was the negative when we were saying it on the night is. I remember someone stood up after Botman scored that corner and just in the main stand, and, and I'll leave a few of the words out that they used, but just said, how the heck is this 3-2 type of thing? We did, like you say, batter them for, for the entirety of that game. I mean, there's probably an obvious candidate, but there should be probably notable mentions as well. Man of the match for you? Yeah, I, th- I think the, the, you know Mo Salah's performance was 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 out of this world, wasn't it? In terms of, I, th- I think first half actually kind of wasteful in his passing, but just just yeah. and he misses the penalty as well. But just the ability to respond to that and come back with two goals and a, a world class assist, you know, 
it, it's it's you know we we know how much Liverpool are going to miss him while he's at Afcon. Hopefully, it it's fallen nicely in terms of how the 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 fixtures look, and, yes. and you know uh, I'm, I'm sure he'd love to go on and win it. But from a purely selfish perspective, hopefully he's not there too long. But I think. You know, you just saw how good he is, and, and we have said it time and time again on this podcast. You know, the the idea that Liverpool was silly to turn down that money just gets made to look more and more ludicrous every week. Um, so yeah, I think he was my man of the match. But in terms of honourable mentions, uh, there's so so many. You know, yeah. I think you know, I mean, if you just go from back to front, I just think you know, Trent, for example, doesn't really sort of put up huge numbers in terms of chance created, mm. but his influence on Liverpool's build-up and some of the passes he was playing and also his defensive work. I know Gordon comes in off that side and when when yeah. he has to get that goal, but I thought otherwise he did a really good job of shutting that down. Uh, you know, going to midfield, Endo sensational again. What a play he's become. Another one who you think, you know, you're almost surprised now it's reached the point where Liverpool will miss him. Um, mm. He definitely, you know, he definitely will. And it, at least there's that time with McAllister coming back. Curtis Jones, possibly possibly one of his best games in Liverpool shirt, at least top five for me. I, I thought he was unbelievable. Uh, again, what a player he's becoming. Has to be, you know, first name on the team sheet there, I think. And then also just hugely encouraged by the fact that for Darwin, still a bit messy in elements. You're always going to get that. But another goal contribution, just, you know, he keeps yeah. getting them. He keeps getting them. Um, and, and I thought it was Luis Diaz's his, his best performance in absolute yeah. ages. And again, if you're looking for big positives to come out of this in terms of, okay, we know how good Salah is and we, you know, he's underlined how much other people are going to miss him. We know Endo's been in great form recently and, and that Curtis Jones has grown this season, but Diaz performing as he did, I think is just absolutely massive ahead of Salah going away and, and what's happened with him recently in terms of his performance level. And as I say, you know, D, uh, Nunez, sorry, getting a, getting another goal contribution. Jota coming on and being influential. Gakpo as well. I just think with yeah. what's going to happen in attack and the the, the problems that Liverpool have to solve in the, the coming weeks without Salah, that was like one of the the feel good stories of the of the game for me. Really, was that that front line and everybody contributing there. Yeah, absolutely. Because because it hasn't been going well, particularly for Luis Diaz, but especially from the off, he was picking the ball up. He was beating his man, and even for. The penalty that was missed, there was that bit where he sort of held off three and then goes on a wind. It's like old Luis Diaz almost was back, so to speak. It, it was great to see. And you're right, there are so, so many positives that way. I mean, concerns wise, and I suppose you kind of answered it in a way, but are you kind of hoping, is it the collective can almost replace Mo Salah as in the rest of the four forwards can replace the overall impact? Is that the sort of concern you're hoping gets dispelled? Yeah, but they have they have to hope that's the case. I think I've said it before. I think Joss is absolutely crucial to that. I think he's got you know that that deadliness in front of goal that maybe some of the others lack. Um, but it, it's just important that you know in terms of contributing. I think you know it's so much easier to shut down Darwin as a source of goals or shut down Gakpo or shut down Salah when you've got you know someone like the, the way that Diaz was playing recently and the fact that he yeah. wasn't really beating his man he was never really a threat on the outside he always wanted to go inside which made it so much easier to nullify him you know if he gets back to a bit of form that is dragging players out it's creating spaces and i think we, yeah. you know that was a a massive influence on on liverpool's attacking performance last night that was that he was back to somewhere close to his best so I think that's the hope is that the, these four plays between them is can, can play as close to the best as possible over this next month or so. And then that will really, really mitigate for missing Salah. And we do know as well that Liverpool now, one of the things that they've not had in the past when Salah's gone away is his goal threat for midfield. And, and Liverpool definitely have yeah. that now. So hopefully that can that can help mi- mitigate it. And, you know, I, I think Jota coming back is, is utterly crucial just in, in terms of that wastefulness because I think he's... I just think he's a difference maker in terms of he just scores goals, he scores scruffy goals, scores good goals, sets goals up. He's so intelligent around the box, and um, so having him back is a, is going to be a big factor, I think, in in mitigating him. But it's going to be also helpful that the, the rest of the attackers looked in really good form last night, and and hopefully he can sustain that now. Yeah, absolutely. They were relentless all night, and. I suppose you, you mentioned goals from midfield. Probably the only sort of negative in any column that we really talk about is it did look like, I think Jurgen Klopp's confirmed it, hasn't he? So Bosley's got a hamstring strain. I suppose that we just were waiting for updates on that. But probably he was one it, it didn't quite happen for, is it fair to say, before his substitution? Yeah, so he's, he's having a scan on that today. So, you know, you can sometimes get away with him. We saw that with Gravenberg, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago. So fingers crossed it's more along those lines. But... 
I think also with, with the way that the, the fixtures are lining up, it, you know, even if he's got a, a two weeker now and it's it's Arsenal in the FA Cup next, isn't it? And then the little bit of yeah. wind break and stuff. You know, I, I'm hoping it's not going to be too disastrous. And it certainly didn't look like he'd, you know, torn it or done anything really serious that uh, that, that, that forced him off. So, you know, I, I'm optimistic around that one. And it maybe will be a nicely timed one for him, really, even if he, if he misses a couple of weeks or so. But... In terms of his performances, yeah, I still think he's a little bit up or up and down at the moment. Um, he still, I think he creates three chances yesterday, which shows that he was he was quite loose in his passing at times. I think that really sticks in your memory. But he's still actually being fairly creative. He was he was setting yeah. things up in moments. So it's not you know it's not that he's playing completely disastrously. And I actually, a lot of the stuff he did on the defensive side of the game was actually really good last night as well. You know. Even when it's not working for him, he'll get back and cover spaces. And I think you've got to consider with Sobers lie that if he keeps doing that side of the game, then the, the class he's got going forward will eventually shine through. And, you know, you could, I know I, this is an unfavorable comparison to, to Jordan Henderson, which I, you know, don't want to slag him off almost a, a key part of, of so many trophy wins. But I think that's maybe the difference is that when Henderson was, was playing poorly, maybe that, you know, his, ability to create and, and and do the things on the attacking side of the game still couldn't match, you know, couldn't match Sober's light yeah. at his best. Exactly. And I think so with Sober's light, if he just keeps doing the Henderson things on the defensive side of the ball, yeah. you're not this huge loss when it's not, you know, he's not absolutely firing on all cylinders creatively. He's still doing that job that the, the manager wants him to do and, and keeping things solid in midfield and keeping things balanced. The rest on top of that, then, you know, if he, he adds back the goals and, and, and the, the, the consistent assists that he was getting in the early part of the season, they'll almost come as a nice bonus when he gets that to click. And I, I do, I, like I say, three chances created yesterday. I don't think he's a million miles off. Um, and, I, I, you know, again, he's just a young player, isn't he, adapting to the Premier League? I'm sure yeah. I'm sure he will be back to his, his best really soon, isn't it? We've seen with Luis Diaz last night, it can click like that. It, it's, it's so Great. sudden when someone comes back into form and, and for no... You know, obvious reason why it happens. So, uh, you know, Sobers, I have no doubts he'll he'll get back there soon. Yeah, and like you said, he's even influencing the game even when he's not firing, which is part yeah. of the ass. He's obviously got that way as well. I mean, we try and avoid these, but the rest just keep bringing us to them a little bit. And and I'm sure you've seen, obviously, on your timeline, Sky, all the things that have blown up over the sort of big two penalty decisions. So. We'll almost do them in reverse because obviously the Jota one's the one that's got the most controversy and people talking. Honest thoughts on the Jota penalty? Yeah, it's just a penalty, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, Martin Dubravka says it himself. It's it's a pen. He, 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 there's clear contact when you see the replays. The fact is, Jota doesn't, you know, the way that these players work, and he's on a goal bonus, by the way, in his contract, as a lot of the forwards are. Um, there's no way he passes up an opportunity to tap the ball yeah. into the net to give Mohamed Salah a penalty when he's already missed one. It's just it's just not happening. So it quite clearly something's gone on there, and he's and, and the, the the trip is enough to to knock him over and make him lose his foot. And I just think there's just there's no debate over it. And I know people will debate it because you know yeah. everyone argues for the decision they want to see rather than reality. But yeah, it's as simple as that. You know, you ask Diogo Jota. Are you ever going to pass up the opportunity to tap the ball into an empty net? And he would not. So it's just no, yeah. And and, and Dubravka said it. So penalty, the, the the end. I think on that one. Indeed, and probably the the more clear cut one for well for everyone else. I think it's pretty the same. The Luis Diaz one as well. Yeah, again, you know, clear contact. I mean, it's not maybe getting booted up in the air, but again, it's there's contact there. As soon as you see the replay, you know it's never getting overturned. And again, he has a, a chance there to to shoot. He's very close to goal to get a shot off. I don't think he'd rather a penalty in that situation. So again, you know, there wasn't two huge complaints from Newcastle about the nature of the penalty either. So I just think that, yeah, again, I think that's a nailed on one. Yeah, it, it does seem crazy that the timeline has gone so, or Twitter, et cetera, has gone crazy. But yeah, it was it was emphatic. I think people sometimes need a side event. But hey ho, and listen, we won. We are top of the league, so that was the big thing of Newcastle. And we always do a player. Sorry, Dave. One, one, one actually, what I just remembered there. That one, one thing I wanted to speak about about the refs actually is I, I wrote a tweet yesterday uh, when the when the game was on. I've, I've deleted it because I was completely incorrect. Really, um, was about um, Anthony Taylor not booking Joe Linton after giving oh, the yeah. advantage played. Um, yeah. which looked on the face of it, I thought, it's a dreadful decision. I thought he's clearly forgotten to book him or, or you know, and then once he's been reminded, 
you know, wanted to save face and didn't want to go back and give the booking because he'd been reminded. Um, and I, I want to hold my hands up and I, I did a thing that I never like to do, which is tweet about referees or tweet about anything when I don't know what I'm talking about. And in this situation, I absolutely did not know what I was talking about because someone, a source at PGMOL actually contacted me and said, look on this one, um, you know, it's basically a situation where if a player is about to receive a booking for stopping a promising attack, but the promising attack actually goes ahead. So as soon as the advantage is played, that negates the yellow card. Now, if if Joe Linton had, had put a bad foul in on him, like a standing on the ankle or whatever, you'd st- you'd go back because it's a it, it's a, a yellow worthy foul. But because it was basically an attempt to stop an attack, but the attack still went ahead anyway. That that is not a yellow card. So the referee was absolutely right in a perfect sort of application of the laws to not go back and book Joe Linton in that situation. So. You know, it just shows you, and I, I always say about refs is that I don't like the hysteria around them, and I, uh, and I, I contributed to that by by tweeting that. And as I say, I've deleted it since because I was I was absolutely wrong on that. And I think that's a a really interesting example, really, of the fact that sometimes we can, you know, there's a few decisions in the game people might disagree with, they might not have liked Anthony yeah, yeah. Taylor's performance. And I, I know the fans at the in the uh, in the ground were kind of getting on his back, and and I myself saw a few that I was kind of like, well, I'm not sure about that. But that that one specific one, which some fans will come away thinking that was a joke, that was a disgrace, yeah, another yeah. bad decision against us. Um, it was absolutely, you know, brilliant refereeing, really, and a correct application of laws. So, you know, we should always hold our hands up in those situations and say, you know, fair play to the referee. He got he got that one right, even though at the time it, it felt incredibly frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I I was at the game and yeah, I let my thoughts be clear on what I thought was. But there you go, I've been educated at the same time as well. So although I think your defence of Anthony Taylor might fall on a few deaf ears, but I think <laughs> it's, good, it's good to get that sort of knowledge, etc. For, for future reference. And in, in fairness, it sounds like he's applied the laws correctly. So yeah, we can't get him for that one at all, no doubts. I mean, this... This player, it's we're going to talk about when we do our player in focus. I know you called him a, a great guy last week. I mean, Joe Gomez now, almost every game, the expectation in a good way has, has gone up and up, hasn't it? Really, I mean, he was he was great in this one. I did notice as well. I don't know if you saw that. There's quite been quite a few media stories on Joe Gomez recently as well. There seems quite a few that have come out almost getting his flowers laid on, so to speak. But. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise, and a license with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. He, he really is sort of shining, I think that's fair to say at the moment, which you wouldn't necessarily think of Gomez, as you probably definitely most wouldn't have thought at the start of the season. How... How good has he been this, this campaign, would you say? Yeah, phenomenal. It massively exceeded sort of my expectations on a personal basis, just talking about it. Because, I mean, last season, like so many, he was he was really poor. And I, I kind of wondered if that would have been a, a, a good time for him to maybe move on and, and seek yeah. first-team football elsewhere, seek a, a regular game at centre-half, maybe somewhere else where he could, you know... If he'd have joined, say, a, a, an Aston Villa, for example, and played centre-half every week for them, I, I you know, I, I would have thought that would have been a great opportunity for him yeah. to show it was about getting himself back into sort of England contention. But so glad he stayed around, stuck around, and, and, and you know, because I think he's, he's not just back to form, he's playing as well as ever, I, I think, at the moment, because it's that flexibility he offers. He's playing well at centre-half, and we know how good he is there because he was a... A crucial part of a Premier League title win inside at such a young age, I think he was 23 when he won that. Um, but his ability to play right back and left back has just gone up and up recently. Like, I, yeah. I just think I used to think you know it was such a it, it used to create a weakness for Liverpool when you put Joe Gomez in at right back as opposed to Trent, and he lose so much creatively. But his his ability and comfort on the ball just seems to have gone up a level. Is I, I think it's not necessarily his comfort on the ball actually. I may be misspeaking there. I think it's more. Because he's always been a capable footballer, but more 
a knowledge of the angles that are created at fullback and how to how to pass through the lines from those positions or how to get on the outside and and, and more consistent pra- practicing of crossing, which is something you would never really do as a centre half, not right. a, not a technique that you would you would practice and an ability to exchange passes with the forward that gets you in at the byline. All those things have come on leaps and bounds, and, and his defending has always been excellent. His recovery pace thought. One of the things he did really well yesterday was he was always the man on the cover. You know, Newcastle want to fire those quick balls in behind, but he was always there. He's always he's lightning quick, isn't he? And I, th- I think the only question mark that is that is left over Joe Gomez is in terms of can he stay fit between now and the end of the season. It's absolutely crucial for Liverpool that he, that he does because he's filling in. You know, he's the backup in about six different positions in the defence, and he's 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 playing well in all of them. So. Um, Liverpool really, really do need him to to stay fit, but yeah, no questions about his quality. As I say, he, and he's gone up to a, to a new level for me. The fact the fact he isn't um, uh, you know unbalancing the team at left back, which is something I yeah. said about him early in the season. Again, he just you know they, they put up set over seven xG with him in the team down that left hand side. Um, yeah, phenomenal football, a great guy. So pleased to see him doing well. It's just been out, outstanding, especially recently. I mean. I was generally thinking about this this morning because inverted's obviously the hot tip or you know take, isn't it? People love inverted players now, especially you know Pep, the way he set up stones into the middle. Even Arsenal are trying to do it, aren't they? With Zinchenko, and they've even had Tommy Asu who can play right back as well, going into that midfield. I genuinely can't think of any other player in the Premier League right now, and you could well be correcting me on this, that can play centre half, left back, and right back. So accomplishedly can you think of anyone at all not not certainly not off the top of my head and not anyone who as you say will be playing it at that level um yeah. that, that's it the fact that he's playing at fullback to, to to this level now is is just yeah remarkable given that we know he's a top class center half i mean he's he's unlucky really in the sense that he isn't liverpool's consistent partner to virgil van dyke's you know yeah. level and his ability um but you know the fact he can fill in everywhere else, he'll always get a game. Um, there's there's no worries about that that he's going to have long stints on the bench because he, he he's so versatile and he's got the ability to fill in everywhere. And Liverpool are always you know going in, in multiple competitions in in seasons where things are going well. So there's always a game there for him. And yeah, long may it continue. Absolutely loving his renaissance this season. It's been one of the one of the stories of the season, as you say. Media are focusing on that now. Hopefully that doesn't you know preempt. Yeah. It. Injury or, or a downturn of any sort. I just really hope he can keep it going because he deserves to. He's he's worked hard to get back to his position and 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 is doing really really well. I suppose the only other negative I can think of, like you said, because there is that media recognition, is the worry as some of us have got that Gareth Southgate might finally cotton on to what he has in Joe Gomez, and obviously there's a summer tournament beckoning as well. Is that a worry? Would you say as well for Liverpool fans? Yeah, I, th- I think when you look at sort of England's options at centre half, it's absolutely madness, really, that he's not already in that mix. You know, he- he's so much better than a lot of them. Um, you know, and-, and the fact that then he, on top of that, he has that flexibility. And in- in- in England have got you know, say Luke Shaw at left back, who's always picking up injuries, isn't he? To to have someone like Joe Gomez who could come in there on the right hand side again. You know, they-, they they don't really make well. Look at Kieran Trippier's form recently. Uh, Joe yeah, Gomez yeah. wouldn't be a bad shout to to start the Euros there, would he? So, um, you know, I, I think it, it's kind of bad news for Liverpool the idea that that Gomez might get called up because it's you know you don't want to put that strain on his body. But I, if it did happen, I'd be really really happy for him because he, like I say, he's a, he's a great lad and and you know on the basis of performances, he absolutely deserves to be part of that England squad at the moment. Yeah, there's no doubt in it. I, I... I think it'd just be madness for them not to take into the Euros, but I'm almost saying that with not wanting it to happen from a Liverpool point of view, but we'll we'll have to see on that. And I mean, we, we talked about there about the risk around Gomez and the only concern being possible injuries. I mean, we finally got, and I know we've been asking you for 8,000 weeks. I know our viewers have been hoping you're going to give us something different, but we did get an update, obviously, from Jurgen Klopp's last press conference. Now, Again, we kind of got a Jurgen Klopp update. And I know you were there, but again, there was a bit of, and I know Jurgen's not going to give a date for each player, don't get me wrong, but obviously people are naturally going to interpret that in different ways. For We know McAllister's back. There was mixed news, wasn't there, over Thiago, Badsetic, and then the Robbo one was the, probably the one, I think, if I'm right, people were sort of grimacing at or a bit unsure. I mean, 
Do you do you look at those? Was there anything you expected or didn't expect from what Jurgen Klopp revealed in that one? Yeah, I, th- I think sometimes people take from these injury updates kind of what they want and whether that's they're a, a glass half empty or glass half full person. To be honest, I, I, nothing really shocked me or felt kind of new about that. I think Robertson's timeline has always been end of January. And again, the manager pretty much confirmed that in terms of he's going to need the month to get back up to speed. But, you know, yeah. if he's not late January, he's going to be quite early February. It's, it, it, it's on that line. But I think that's not a huge shock. That would be at worst a, a week delay to what you'd hope at the best case scenario would be. So, uh, you know, Robbo for me is, is, is right on track and, and, and will be great to have him back he, as well as Joe Gomez is playing. You know, you, you want your first choice left back there if you can get him fit. So, I think that's, yeah, like I say, on track again, Thiago, I asked him months ago, didn't I? And, and he sort of said in, in the new year, and again, he's on track for that. Should, you know, the hope is that he's, he's back in first team training pretty soon. He seems to be quite close to that. So hopefully over this next week or two weeks, we, we, we see him back in training and, and back to have a big influence on the running. Um, and, and by Chetic, I, I guess that's the one, the one mystery really is we don't really know and Liverpool are reluctant to put any sort of time scale on it. Very, very similar issue to, to that that Curtis Jones had recently really where they didn't want to put any time on it and, 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 and they just sort of, you have to let this issue settle down and then when it does, you can play and play and play. Um, I, I saw him at Anfield last night actually with his family. He was taking pictures on the on the pitch after the, the game had, had, had finished up and saw him there and he seemed pretty happy and, and stuff. So, I mean, you know, it's just a, it's just about being patient, isn't it? And, and you know, by Chetic, you can play any role this season. That that feels like it would almost be a bonus now. But I think the the, the good thing is that, that Liverpool have set themselves up in a way that they're not absolutely reliant on either of these players, Thiago or by Chetic in midfield. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, if we get Thiago now from from mid January maybe till till the end of the season, what an unbelievably nice bonus that will be. Uh, by Chetic again, if he plays any part, but it. The, the Thiago, they, they could maybe need him because I think he will. He, he he's such a good player that he could be he could be massively influential in the running. But by Chesic, they don't need to rush him. He's a young player. Um, just take your time. Make sure he gets him right. Let's not ruin his career by by giving him early injuries or playing him too much when he when he has to play through pain. Um, and, and it is it's a it's a it's a good position to be in. You know these are viewed as luxuries at the moment. And yeah, like I say, with Thiago, him coming back now or coming back soonish. Um, that's going to be a really, really nice bonus because I still think it's, it's just going to be an interesting selection decision when he's back, isn't it? Um, you know, really excited to see him play because he's so, so good. Yeah, I mean, especially this season, you, you've talked about it before, it's the difference from the bench so often and even if we just get him on that and he could just play sort of half an hour and just make things tick, it, it could just change the game completely in certain aspects. So yeah, God, if we can get him back, that would be brilliant as well. And Speaking of coming back, obviously Liverpool, I know you'd said it to us before, but Liverpool did confirm it that Fabio Carvalho is back. Or they cancelled his loan with RB Leipzig. I don't think that was a, any sort of surprise for anyone, really. I mean, is there any talk about what's next for him? Because people obviously speculate, like, could he be used with Salah away? Is it like a loan? Where does he go? Is there a sort of latest with that at all? Yeah, I, I fully expect him to go out on loan. That's the that's the talk now. Um there's there's no chance I, I I think that it will be used in the in the in the coming month or so because obviously if Liverpool did that you can't then can't play for three clubs in a season uh, and yeah. he really wouldn't get used very much at Liverpool once Salah's back anyway or even when Salah's away to be honest um, Liverpool are really focused on now getting him alone where there will be guaranteed minutes where they can maybe write into the contract that you know there'll be a penalty to pay if he doesn't play a certain amount of minutes over the remainder of the season because. They, they want to see him play, you know, whether that's to prove that he's ready for Liverpool or or just to bolster his own value ahead of a, an eventual move away. Uh, Liverpool are desperate to see him play. And I know the player himself really wants to, to play football after a, what's been a, a frustrating time at Leipzig. So that that's definitely the plan now is to is to find him a low move ASAP and, and get him out for the second half of the season. Yeah, it, it just seems good for, for him more than anyone else. And even, I'm sure you've seen it, it's championship clubs linked, but he's, he's shown at that level. It'd be great just for him to get that confidence back. And as you said, more importantly, just get first team football back on the agenda for him. That That's the, the crucial thing. And I mean, so it doesn't sound like we're probably going to see him in the, this coming week. It's, it's Arsenal next in the cup. I know I kind of alluded to this last week, but with now... People go in and do and Salah with the reality of Zabozlai, you know, and we're not quite sure about that. It's having the scan today. 
you probably seen it yourself on sort of social media. There is a lot of fans going, send the kids. This is the toughest draw we've got. Are you sort of leaning towards that at all? Or are you thinking, I would do it, but Jurgen Klopp probably won't type of thing? What are you expecting for this one? I mean, I don't think he's going to put the, the kids out. I don't think it's going to be a team like uh, Aston Villa away a few yeah. years back. I don't think it's going to be anything like that. But I, but I think we've had a really strong indication of what it's going to be, which is a, a mix and match of a team. And that that for me came with with Owen Beck returning from his low move. Yeah, um, they've clearly acknowledged that that okay, throwing Chambers or Scanlon in is is maybe a risk at this point. You know that that's a. I think neither of them have really shown in the, the games they've had so far that they're quite ready for that step up to first team football. Yeah. It's got both brilliant talents, by the way. I'm not this is not writing them off. They're both very young, but they're, they're both behind Beck in terms of the level of development. You know, Beck has had first team loans. He's been out there. He's played for more football. So I think bringing him back shows you that he's probably going to be in the starting lineup against Arsenal. You're going to see a bit of rotation. Like I say, I think you you, you know Drell Quanta coming in for a start, for example. I think he's just going to be. A little bit of a mix of a team and and, and some kids in there, maybe a, a Kate Gordon, for example, as well. Um, so I don't think it's going to be anywhere near Liverpool's strongest, but it's not going to be a, a completely throw in it either. Liverpool have got options to to rotate. Yeah. I think they'll take that. But I think, you know, if you make a few changes at Arsenal, it's a tough place to go, even if they're not playing well at the moment. You know, there's every chance Liverpool maybe get knocked out. But I'm also kind of in the mindset it's not a disaster if that happens. If you yeah. if you can't win this trophy go out in the third round is, is that's probably, you know, if they're the two alternatives, you know, I think going out in the third round wouldn't be a disaster for where Liverpool are up to in, in all the other tournaments at the moment. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48 hour no obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes, and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. It does have that feel, doesn't it? He's never going to admit that publicly, Jurgen Klopp. But if you did get him in private and had a, you know, an Erdogan or whatever, then he might yeah. just say, I'd, "Well, you know. I know what he'll say to us, which is kind of, look, I'm reacting to the the busy period we've been through, and we have to make changes." And he's kind of right, but he's also kind of thinking, I guess that it's it's going to be a, you know, Liverpool are in the position they are in the Premier League. They've got League Cup semis coming up. It's it's more it's as much a recognition of what's been as as what's to come really and, and you know Liverpool have got a lot of fixtures ahead in many ways so if they can if they end up not having a, a fourth round FA Cup tie and you know like I say it wouldn't be a disaster I, I think that actually the worst possible outcome is maybe a draw and a replay yeah. definitely don't want that yeah Jurgen Klopp will 100% not be wanting that and I mean that maybe and it, I, I'd be honest for myself saying this I'm kind of I you should never dismiss a competition, but everyone's starting to look ahead to that Carabao Cup semi-final, that first leg. Probably the, the other question to that, and if it is a, a rotated side, do you think anyone off the back of Newcastle and the way things have gone have like really played themselves in, as in like, I'd be surprised if they didn't start? Because you'd think he'd play his strongest lineup against Fulham, surely? Yeah, I, th- I mean... A lot of the, you know, some of the selection decisions kind of make themselves, don't they, in, in some aspects. For example, you know, McAllister coming back in for Endo. Uh, I think that back five is is kind of pretty settled, isn't it? If you're talking about Liverpool's team, you know, you drop McAllister back in. Curtis Jones, I just don't think you can take him out of the team at the moment, the way he's playing. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what he does in the absence of Sobers like, whether he gives Elliot yeah. that chance. But again... You know, Salah's away, so, so is Elliot needed in that front line to provide that balance? Um, 
it, that that th- those are for me are going to be the, the interesting selections is what he does about Sobberslier's absence. It was, it was interesting that Gravenberg came into that position and maybe that pushes Elliot up into into the front line. I, I would like to see personally Elliot on that right hand side. Actually, if we're talking about that as a as possibly the biggest selection decision really because I just think what he provides balance wise. He got five shots away against West Ham, quite unlucky not to score. If he keeps generating those shot numbers, he'll he'll score a lot of goals from that position and. You know, he's a natural in that position. I think one of the things that's kind of, there's a reluctance around from Jürgen, I, I, I sense, in terms of putting Elliot into the team, particularly, you know, bringing him on maybe against Arsenal or or, 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 or doing so last night against Newcastle, a reluctance there because you're up against teams who are physically so imposing. Yeah. You don't want to concede a goal from a set piece. And if you're surrendering a, a tall midfielder like Sobers like putting in someone like Gravenberg who can defend set pieces himself is an easier decision to make when you're making your substitution. Throwing Elliot in is slightly risky in that regard. But I think it kind of that problem solve it, solves itself if the man he's replacing is Mohamed Salah, who himself is not great at defend you know, he doesn't defend corners at all. And um, he's usually the last man to to break away on the attack. If you allow Elliot to take on that role, that, that problem solves itself. So I think for me that 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 might sort of factor into his thinking. It be you know this is a good opportunity as well to to get Elliot into the team, which is yeah absolutely. And the irony of it all is we had a load of tall players on and we just switched off for Newcastle second. Yeah, that yeah. in the box, no one seemed awake at all. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll we'll go to the questions from the viewers, and it's probably fair to say at this point as we've agreed. We, we talked about Owen Beck, et cetera, that each week we'll, we'll kind of, rather than having to be prompted, we'll always give during January sort of any transfer updates and we'll, we'll chat about those. I mean, it's probably quite a quick one. We know Owen Beck's coming back. That's been confirmed by the club and you mentioned the other scenarios. It's other than that, it's just nothing really happening, just waiting to hear really in case anything does break. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, very, very quiet at the moment. Again, I don't, you know, I don't think they're going to sign. Well, I know they're not going to sign. There's no plans to sign at the moment at left back. That you know, they figure they're pretty well covered off there. Expect Owen Beck to to play in that FA Cup game, and then that obviously sets him up. Then he has to stay at Liverpool for the remainder of the season. Then he won't be able to to go out on another loan. Maybe it does open up the opportunity for for Scanlon or or Chambers to go out on loan. I think I think Chambers in particular maybe that that would be a good move for him now. I think it's you know there's an acknowledgement that he maybe needs a little bit more first team football at the minute. So that that's one to to keep an eye on. So, but as I say, don't expect any signs at left back. I don't think Liverpool need to, and I, I think that's their thinking as well. Um, and in terms of other positions as well, you know, the Salah absence is a brief one. It's similar for Endo, Liverpool will b- believe they can get through with the numbers and the quality that they've got. Uh, and the fact that some players are coming back from injury now. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be an interesting one uh, to to sort of ask people who are desperate for signings, is what what position would, would people really like to to see a signing in? And for me, I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything that would make such a humongous difference till the end of the season, really, that I could think that Liverpool are particularly desperate for. So, and I think, I, I very much think that's the, the thinking around the club at the moment that, if they need to start making changes, that's one for the summer and, and, and those positions yeah. naturally open up, e.g. Thiago leaving on a on a free. Obviously, Matip eventually have to make a decision what they do there. Um, but that, yeah, I think I think it's it's going to be a quiet January. And and that, for me, people might disagree. I, I think that's a, a sensible move as things stand in terms of the injury picture. Yeah, absolutely. Which we have to pray doesn't change at all. Yeah. It seems to yeah. be doing for the worst. Uh, in that regard, absolutely. And I can't believe I'm actually going to ask you this is the final question, but a number of people, I'm sure based on the pictures of him there, were, were asking this question. It's not quite worked out brilliantly for Bobby Firmino, let's put it that way, in Saudi. I can't believe I'm going to ask you this, David, but any chance of the short term, everyone wants to know. I'm guessing that's going to be a quick dispelling. Yeah. I can't. I can't see that one. I'll be honest. I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely love it. Be, you know, the the it'd be, it'd be great to see him uh, playing for Liverpool again. Even just the, the odd sub appearance or, or covering up in the in the cups and things like that. But no, I, I, you know, I, I do think he's going to move on in January. It's interesting. I had a, a conversation with someone kind of close to Firmino who said he's he's actually quite happy at Al Ali. He's not, you know, certainly not a position where he's absolutely pushing for a move away or or, or doing anything like that. But I think it's. I think there's going to be a case where other clubs are going to push for him and, and, and Al Ali are going to give him a decision to make in terms of, look, do you want to go out and play? Um, so, yeah, I think he, he possibly will be moving on in January, but uh, I can't see it being Liverpool or the ones who, who come in for him, unfortunately. 
yeah, I think everyone would love to hear that chant go around the ground again, but it, it seems pretty impossible to see. So, yeah, listen, it, it, it's good, always good to catch up. It's a quiet January set for the window, but everything on the pitch is absolutely brilliant, so we've got to take that. So, for the first time in 2024, all it really leaves me to say is, as ever, David, thanks for your time and insight. Much appreciated. No, thanks for having me. Good stuff. And ladies and gents, that was the first of 2024 Media Matters for Anfield Index. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.